Absolutely. I was 10 years old when I got my first pair of drumsticks, which were huge, long, fat, 3S kind of sticks. And I was, you know, this big when I got them, so I looked like a, you know, a very weird looking troll kind of kid. And, and I got my little red drum pad that had the thick piece of rubber on it, and that was um, my first drum set. And uh, when my parents saw that I was pretty serious about it, they took me into New York City to a local uh, music store and got me my first drum set, which was a black lacquer Ludwig kit. And uh, the bass drum was a 12 by 20 with a snare drum and a 10 inch cymbal that had no brand name on it at all. And that was my drum set. I remember being really, really little and seeing the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, and uh, there was Ringo Starr playing, you know, this little Ludwig drum set, and from that day on, I knew I had to play drums. So much of what he did on the Beatles recordings were signature-oriented drum parts, and by that I mean you can hear the drum part without the rest of the band playing, and you know what song it is. Every song was not mm, pa, mm, mm, pa, Ticket to Ride was mm, pa, mm, Blah, blah, mm, da, mm, mm, snare, Tom. Just the fact that someone thought to do that, to me, is ingenious. Technically, it's not difficult, but uh, some of the most memorable moments in music don't come from the sheer technique displayed, but from what the imagination comes up with. It's hard to not sound cliche-like when you talk about John Bonham, because everybody says the same thing. There is something in the way that he played, his touch on the drums that was really special, that we all strive for. He influenced me tremendously. And uh, what was so cool about him was, although most of what he did wasn't technically that you know, difficult to figure out, there were those moments that he would come up with a drum part that was just priceless. Ginger Baker also was a bit influential for me. I liked what Cream was doing. They, they seemed to stretch the boundaries of blues and rock. And he was the first drummer I had ever heard that played two bass drums and an extended drum solo. I also should mention Clive Bunker, who was the original drummer in Jethro Tull, had a very unusual approach, a very busy style of playing, which producers of today would say, no, 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 you hit more than one snare note in that measure. And, you know, all that he did was, uh, filling up all the measures. Again, you could tell he was coming from a big band style background of drumming, and I thought it fit the early tall music great. Mitch Mitchell was a very big influence on me. Uh, just, just as uh, Billy Cobham, I felt, had uh, very successfully fused jazz and rock together, Mitch Mitchell obviously came from a jazz background because the way he played with Jimi Hendrix was not just pure rock. Probably the Mahavishnu Orchestra was the band that turned my head around as far as what I wanted to do with music and drumming. There was something so challenging about the music when I heard that first record, The Inner Mounting Flame. Uh, Billy Cobham's drumming was the first drumming I had ever heard that really f convincingly fused the intensity of jazz 
and the involvement and technical mastery of jazz drumming with the, the sheer power of rock. I first met Steve Morse and Andy West and Alan Sloan uh, when we were college students at the University of Miami. I met Steve in an improvisation class. I was playing piano in the class. So he didn't know that I was a drummer at the time. He thought I was this piano player. And when he found out that I was a drummer, he invited me to come to a jam that his band was having one evening somewhere. and. I knew that I was in for a treat going there because in this improvisational class were all these guitarists and they all looked like they were the same person. They all had short hair, they all had fat guitars that had no treble on them and had all bass tone. And everything that they played were these, and they were all great players, but they were these stock licks that you learn when you're in school like do 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 and then off in the corner was Steve Morse, long, straight, blonde hair, jeans. He wasn't wearing shoes. Solid body Fender guitar, you know, with four pickups or whatever, with the most awesome rock tone. And he just stuck out from the pack. You know, we were in this jazz program, but here obviously was a person filled with imagination and his own unique sound in every way. And from the first note, I was flipping out because this was right around the time that I was a Mahavishnu Orchestra fanatic into this whole new fusion thing. And I could tell from the songs that Steve was writing that he was being influenced from the, that same music that I was. I thought we had so many different unique sounds coming from the band that uh, it was going to put the band over the top. Needless to say, you know, the reality of the music business kind of hit me like a brick wall right from the point that uh, we shopped our demo, which was a, uh, a record that we made r prior to leaving the school. They, they had just put in a 24-track facility. We recorded 10 songs and put it into a record format thinking that, you know, when we shop this to record companies, they will see how serious we are. Instead of putting it, you know, on a cassette, let's do a whole record. Make it seem like it's ready to go. We completed the record, brought it to New York, and Steve, Andy, West, and I, we went around to all the major record companies, maybe 20 of them, and, you know, we walked in. We're the hot kids from the University of Miami. You may have heard of us, Rock Ensemble, too. You know, of course not. And, uh, about three weeks later, Steve, you know, had 20 or 30 rejection notices hanging from his wall. You know, thank you, but who are you guys kidding? You know, there's no singing, you can't dance to it. What are you guys? Why don't you have a disco beat?